here. So, uh, okay. <clears throat> Assuming you watched the lecture I posted on whatever day that was, Monday, and thank you for being patient and everything. Um, that lecture went up to around line 840 when Sir Gowan arrives at the castle and we're going to hear the guy who owns the castle or the lord of the castle named shortly and his name is <coughs> Sir Bertalak de Out Desert which some scholars yeah, pretty old scholars. I mean, quite a long time ago. I don't think anybody has argued or suggested this in the last 40 or 50 years. That the name possibly gives a reference to the locale of the poem. Okay? Bertulac means Green Lake. Bertulac like in Verdi. Okay? The V and B linguistically are very similar. So Green Lake of or by the high desert. Now there is no real high desert in the UK in terms of what we think of as desert, right? Uh, there are moors. Um, there are high plains, so to speak, up in the Yorkshire Dales in um parts of Scotland and such. We know the poem, you know, if, if you watch the lecture, I talked about this. Uh, we know the poem was written in the area around Chester, England, in the Northwest Midlands. Not quite high deserty, um, Moorish, not Moorish, Moory, however you would play that there. So Sir Gowan gets there and, and he's traveled for a long time. He's fought ogres, he's fought giants, he's fought bears, he's for some reason fought ox um, and such. And he arrives at the castle and he meets the lord of the company, and this is why I closed the previous lecture, and says, who says to him, line 835, you are welcome to do as you please with everything here, all is yours to have and command as you wish. So Gallant says, thanks indeed. Christ repay your noblesse. Okay? And they hug each other. Let's see. Um, so we get Sir Gowan's impression of this knight, this lord. A great sized knight indeed, like 844. In the prime of life, broad and glossy was his beard, all reddish brown, stern face, standing firmly on powerful legs, with a face fierce as fire, noble in speech. He truly seemed capable of being a master of a castle with outstanding knights. So the lord leads him to a chamber. Orders, you know, everything to be done well for him. Good food, nice curtains, all nine yards. Walls are covered with hangings from, we're told, specific places. And that's indicating the richness of the castle. Okay? And, and by the way, you know, one of the things about Sir Gowan and the Green Knight is <clears throat> the richly detailed descriptions. Uh, uh, for example, armor, clothing, customs, decoration, all those kinds of things, and there are more, indicates the audience for this poem. The audience is not, you know, poor Joe who spends 12 hours a day out in the field and then comes in and eats slop and goes to sleep at night. The audience is what? Highly aristocratic. I mean, the, the audience is the upper ep, upper echelons of society. The audience is the kind of people we see in the poem. It's the Sir Gowans, it's the lords of the castles, the knightly aristocratic class, all right? So, let's see here. Da, da, da. We get Sir Gowan's, you know, description of the clothes that he's given to wear, fine tablecloth, color, 
a lot of descriptive detail, which I'm skipping almost all of. Um, 901. Then he was tactfully questioned and asked a discreet inquiry addressed to that prince, so that he must politely admit he belonged to the court which noble arts of that gracious man ruled alone, who is the great and royal king of the round table. And that it was Gawain himself, or Gowan, however you want to pronounce it, who was sitting there having arrived there at Christmas as his fortune chanced. Notice what that, with those lines, are telling us. He discreetly questioned. How do you ask questions discreetly? It's not like news reporters do when the president's walking across the White House lawn to, to catch Marine One there, the, you know, the chopper that takes him someplace. Mr. President! And they just yell out the most, you know, offensive question they can think of. Kind of no. This is all subterfuge. This is all, you know, finding things out indirectly. Right? So they had noticed he had to politely admit he belonged to Arthur's round table. What else did he have to politely admit? He is, in fact, Sir Gawain. Now, if we go back to the opening of the poem, how is Sir Gawain described? Or how did he describe himself? Hmm? Kind of dumb. Least of Arthur's knights. In fact, why does he even suggest he is one of Arthur's knights? What does the poet tell us about Sir Gawain's relationship to King Arthur? Arthur is his uncle. And he's kind of like, you know, Uncle Artie, Uncle Artie, can, can I take on this knight? Because I'm what? I'm the dumbest of your knights. I'm the least of your knights. I'm the weakest of your knights. Okay? The implication is, if something happens to me, no loss to him. Right? That's the portrayal we get at the opening. Now we're going to get a different portrayal of Sir Gawain. Alright? So, and he's there at Christmas time, notice. Christmas time is how many days away, or Christmas, is how many days away from the day that he's supposed to meet the Green Knight. The previous thing happened on New Year's. He had a year and a day. Okay? So by January 2nd, he's got a week. Got a week. Because this is Christmas Day. All right? So, uh, how did I turn this page? So, all the men were told by 910 in the castle were overjoyed to make the acquaintance quickly then of the man to whom all excellence and valor belongs, whose refined manners are everywhere praised and whose fame exceeds any other persons on earth. It's not King Gawain's kingdom. It's King Arthur's kingdom. It's not King Gawain's knights. It's King Arthur's knights. It's not King Gawain's round table. It's Arthur's round table. And yet, the narrator has just told us, Gawain is thought to be the epitome of knightlyhood. In fact, they whisper to each other, the knights in this castle. 916. Now we shall enjoy seeing displays of good manners and the irreproachable turns of noble speech, the art of conversation we can learn unasked. Since we have taken in the source of good breeding, truly God has been gracious to us indeed in allowing us to receive such a guest as going in, whose birth men will happily sit down and celebrate in song. So what are they saying to each other? Well, shoot, Jimbal, we got here Sir Gawain. We can learn how to talk real good. Why did I just slip into that kind of accent? How far is this castle from King Arthur's? It's a long distance. If King Arthur's is taken to be the center of courtly manners and behavior. This castle is about as far away from that center as you can get. 
What's, what's the cultural center of the United States of America? You can probably pick one of three cities. New York, Metropolitan Opera, Broadway. I mean, you talk about theater, it's New York. It's Broadway, right? Maybe Washington, D.C., Kennedy Center, okay? Maybe L.A. if you're into the more, you know, mass culture kind of stuff. It's not Woodbury, Tennessee. This is Woodbury. Compared to Arthur's Camelot being Washington or New York. Okay? So there's thinking, oh, finally, somebody can show us what the proper manners are. So, uh, the lady wishes were told to set eyes on the night, line 940, and left her pew with many fair women. She was the loveliest on earth in complexion and features, in figure, in coloring, and behavior above all others, and more beautiful than Guinevere. Now, I'll just tell you right now, in medieval liter literature, anytime somebody said to be more beautiful than Guinevere, them fighting words. Somebody's going to have a comeuppance. All right? More beautiful than Guinevere. It seemed to the knight, that is, Sir Gowan. And here's, here's why you could say, well, them's, them's not fighting words. What is Guinevere to Sir Gowan? Oh, if Arthur's his uncle, she's his aunt, or aunt. There can't be any romantic stuff going on there. There can't even be any romantic, erotic thought going on there. So the thing of her being more beautiful it's like, oh, okay, so I can think about this woman a little bit differently than I can my aunt, Guinevere, all right? And there is definitely romantic and erotic thought going on. If it's not clear now, it'll be very clear within the next few pages. So she comes through to meet him, and she's leading her by the left hand, this other lady. This is a bit ambiguous. Line 947. Another lady leading her by the left hand. Does that mean the other lady has her left hand out and is leading the beauty, which would kind of indicate the beauty has, is being led by her right hand, or is the beautiful one have her left hand out and she's being led by the other lady by her right hand? And the reason I, you know, nitpick over this is because it's kind of important. In Latin, anybody know what the word for left is in Latin? Sinistra. It's the word from which we get sinister. Okay. And this woman, leading the beautiful woman, is sinister. We'll find out later. Okay? So the other woman, the one doing the leading, notice we're told, who was older than she, an aged one it seemed, and respectfully treated by the assembled knights. But very different in looks were those two ladies, for where the young one was fresh, the other was withered. I mean, the young one, like a 20-year-old, perfect complexion, you know. The other one, not so much. Every part of that one, the young one, was rosily aglow. She just has this really nice blush. On that other, rough, wrinkled cheeks hung in folds. You know what a Sharpe dog looks like? She's a human Sharpe, just wrinkles coming down her face. Many bright pearls adorn the kerchiefs of one whose breast and white throat uncovered and bare. It doesn't mean she's walking around topless. It does mean she has a low-cut gown, okay? Shone more dazzling than snow, new fallen on hills. In other words, there's an imp the, the ideal of beauty being discussed here is whiteness. It's the same ideal of beauty that they had in the Renaissance 200 years later, right? If you look at portraits done of Queen Elizabeth, in the mid 16th century. There's one in your book. She's white, white. I mean like paper white. 
all the portraits show this. It's not that she was really that white guy. It's the powder that she would put on her face. Okay. Later, that image, even in her time period, that image of whiteness as the immaculate beauty gets, I don't want to put it, frowned upon, spurned. Shakespeare's going to write a sonnet that's going to turn everything on its head. Okay? Because it's, it's unreal. <laughs> it's an ideal, not a reality. And Shakespeare's sonnet's going to talk about, yeah, well, my woman, she's not like this false painted you know, woman. Anyways, so, the other, the older one, wore a gorget over her neck. That is, she's got clothing that comes all the way up to her chin, her swarthy chin wrapped in chalk white veils, her forehead enfolded in silk, muffled up everywhere. Right? She's dressed like a nun. Everything except for eyes, nose, mouth are covered in white. Why white? Oh, purity. Right? With embroidered hands, lattice work of tiny stitching, so that nothing was exposed of her but her black brows, her two eyes and her nose, her naked lips, which were repulsive to see and shockingly bleared. And it's not clear what the poet means by lips that are bleared. He talked about bleary eyes. Bleary eyes means your eyes are kind of watery, cloudy. How are your lips? How are your lips watery and cloudy? I don't know. It's not an image that's attractive. Um, the noble lady, indeed, you might call her by God, with body squat and thick, that is, she's short and fat, and buttocks bulging broad, more delectable in looks. Pause. Turn the you know your eyes to the next line. Was the lady whom she left. So notice what the narrator is focusing on. You have these two women. One absolutely dropped dead gorgeous. The other, the exact opposite. <laughs> right? And the the narrator is focusing on what? The looks. Right? Gwen Gawain glances at the beauty who favored him with a look. And taking leave of the Lord, he walked towards them. The older one, he salutes with a deep bow to the old fat squat one and takes the lovelier one briefly into his arms. Kisses her respectfully and courteously speaks. Now, I don't know about you, but briefly takes her into his arms. That's not like a side of the cheek. That's an embrace. Huh. They asked to make his acquaintance. He begs truly to be their servant, if that would please them. Why? <coughs> because we're being shown here part of the courtly love tradition. We're being introduced to the courtly love tradition, which I'll talk about, if not today, Friday. Um, so he says, I'd like to be your servant. Okay? In a courtly love tradition, you have a knight, you have a lady. The lady is the lady of the castle, who is the wife of the lord of the castle. Maybe a baron, could be a you know, king, duke, something like that. And that baron, king, duke has a bunch of knights underneath him who serve him. All right? Think like the thanes in the old English period, right? And she's kind of, you know, queen of the castle, so to speak, and the knights do her bidding. Go do this, go do that, slay this monster, capture this dragon, blah, 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 okay? In the courtly love tradition, the reason they do her bidding is because they want to sleep with her. They want to win her in bed. But in order for her to give up to their desires, they have to perform certain deeds. They have to show their worthiness. Okay? Courtly love tradition at its heart is adulterous. It, it, it's based on adultery. And that's because part of the reason behind it is it was thought, you know, 
Married love is a fulfilling. It's not romantic. Romantic love is that kind of bitterness of love. It's that kind of love that you can't have, you know, just to produce kids and pass on the family inheritance kind of thing. And I'm going to, I don't think I've done it yet. I'll put up on the, um, on D2L, I've got a, a handout of, I don't remember what it is, 25, 50 rules for courtly love. These were real rules that had to be followed, it's thought. Okay? At least in the courtly love literary tradition. There's a lot of dispute, used to be a lot of dispute, not much today, um, over whether or not the courtly love tradition was real in reality. That is, were real flesh and blood knights trying to seduce their ladies their lord's wives, okay, um, you know, and achieving, you know, these quests in order to do that part. So, when he says he would like to be their servant, that's part of what's going on here. He's swearing fealty. So if you say, I will be your servant, what does that mean for the person one is serving? Well, okay, then serve me. Go do this, go do that, go, etc., etc. They place him between them and lead him, still chatting, to a private room, to the fireplace. They call for cakes, etc., etc. And he, the Lord, and Sir Gowan make merry with drinking and games, etc. So, the next day, 995, when everyone remembers the time when God who died for our salvation was born, joy spreads through every dwelling on earth for his sake. So did it there. It's Christmas Day now. Notice the poet emphasizes this, you know, idea. This is the day God became man for the salvation of all. Cool. So there's joy throughout the house. They have great meals and such. We're told, line 1010, Sir Gowan found enjoyment in the company of his beautiful partner, that is, the lady of the castle, to a playful exchange of private remarks and well-mannered small talk unsullied by sin. So, you know, they at times kind of get together and they have these little conversations and we're told these conversations are unsullied by sin. There's nothing dirty, let's say, going on there. Or there's nothing untoward. There is nothing implied that their pleasure surpassed every princely amusement for sure. So, great joy filled that day and the one following. And a third is delightful came pressing after. So, we're now on the 27th. Okay. And was the end of the festivities, the people supposed, the guests were to leave early next morning, so they reveled all night, drinking the wine, etc., etc. God, Sir Gowan bids goodbye to his host that, for that night, leads him to his room, and says, the knight says to Sir Gowan, 1035, Indeed, sir, as long as I live, I shall be the better, because Gawain was my guest at God's own. I'm going to remember this day forever, because you celebrated Christmas, Christmas, with us. And Sir Gowan's like, oh, shucks. All thanks, sir. In truth, it is yours. All the honor falls to you, and may the high king repay you. Now, high king, that could refer to Arthur. Or it could refer to God. Usually you would think, if it's referring to God, high king would be capitalized. Right? I am at your commandment to act on your bidding, as I am duty-bound to in everything large or small by right. Why is he duty-bound to act on his bidding? Yes, sir? He gave him hospitality. What else? Explain what you mean by that, Lou. He <coughs> exactly. As long as Sir Gowan is under his roof, this knight is his lord. It's kind of like, you know, my house, my rules. Well, part of that my house, my rules mean, means is when you come in my house, you serve me. 
You're now answerable to me in this medieval warrior society. Okay? So, Sir Gowan, we're told, the Lord tried stren strenuously to lengthen Sir Gowan's stay, but Gowan answered him, he could not delay. He's like, why? What, you know, what's, what do you have coming up? And so he told him. Um, you are right to wonder, line 1051, a task important and pressing drove me into the wild, for I am summoned in person to seek out a place with no idea wherever what, wherever, with no idea whatever where it might be found. What was the place he was told to seek out? The green jump. What did the green knight say? If you really look for it, you will find it. Okay? Notice what that implies. What's the reverse of that? If you don't find it, you didn't really look for it. So either way, it's down screwed. Either he looks for it, finds it, and gets his head locked off. Second part of the beheading game. Or you don't find it, which means you didn't look for it, which means you're not really an honorable knight. Okay. Remember what a shield has? Let's say a shield, but something like that. No, no. What's it have on the inside? There's an icon of the Virgin Mary. So that when he holds that shield up, he sees Mary, Mother of God, protector of Christians, you know, the whole nine yards, right? What's on the outside? Five, one, two, three, four, five pointed star. Without the lines, you know, going in between. And each of these stands for what? These are the five fives. We'll go over, we'll go back over again. If you watched the previous lecture, I go in. The five fives, these five virtues and such that Sir Gowan supposedly has. So if he fails to show up, this is all a lie. Right? So the knight tells him, or he keeps going on and says, you know, don't know where it is, but if I fail to reach it New Year's morning for all the land in England, so help you, I mean, our Lord. Therefore, I'm this request, I must make it be now. You truthfully tell me if you've ever heard of a green chapel and where it stands. Okay. And the knight laughs and says, Now you must stay, line 1068, top of the next page, 254, for I shall direct you to your meeting at the year's end. Let the whereabouts of the Green Chapel worry you no more, for you shall lie in your bed, sir, taking your ease until late in the day. Leave on the first of the year. Reach that place at midday. So you can lie in bed till late in the morning, and you'll still be there by midday. It'll take an hour or two. So stay here. Leave on New Year's. We'll put you on the path. It's not even two miles away. Then Gawain was overjoyed and barely laughed. Okay. He says, I will stay here and do whatever else you think fit. So the host seized him, set Gawain by his side. Notice that the host seized him. It kind of sounds like picks him up and puts him down. It's telling us how big the host is. Should be a little clue. Um... He said, okay, you said you do whatever I want, huh? Yeah. While I'm under your roof, 1092, I do I obey your bidding. Okay. He says, all right. So you worried yourself traveling from afar. He says, um, here's what we'll do. Tomorrow, you stay in your bed, lie at your ease in the morning until mass time. The idea or the implication is they celebrate a mass every morning in this castle. Okay. And then go to dine when you like with my wife, who will sit at your side and be your charming companion until I come home. You stay. I'll rise at dawn, and hunting will I go. That's kind of like, cool. Yeah, that's fine. Further, we're not done. Let's make an agreement. Whatever I catch in the wood shall become yours. And whatever mishap 
comes your way, give me in exchange. Let us swap swap. Swear to me. By God, I agree to that, and your love of me is a taste of too much. So, someone brings them a drink, and they drink on it. So, we get the beginning of the exchange of wings. So, for the next morning, the night we'll go hunting, and your gal will sleep in, go to church, have a meal with the wife. The evening and the night will come back. Whatever he wins, whatever he kills in his hunt, he'll give to Sir Gallon. And whatever, as he puts it, whatever mishap comes your way, you'll give me in exchange. Now, mishap means by chance. But mishap can also mean bad chance. Whatever mishappens comes your way. So it could be, you know, I go out, I kill a deer, you get the deer. You know, you get a bad cold. <laughs> you got to give that to me. It could be an unequal, you know, exchange in other words. So they agree. And we get part three, or fit three. So early the next morning, the lord of the castle goes off and goes hunting. And we get a long description of the hunt. Right? But we're told, line 1179, and the good man Gawain lies in his fine bed, lying snug, while the daylight gleamed on the walls. And while the daylight gleamed on the walls, is telling us the sun's been up for several hours. He's being lazy. And as he lazily dozed, 1182, he heard slyly made a little noise at his door, and it stealthily opened. He raised up his head from the bedroom. See, he's not asleep. He's just lying there now. And he hears a noise, and he kind of gets up off the bed. He doesn't get out of bed, but he rises up from the bedclothes, and he lifts the corner of the curtain. He's in a big four-poster bed with curtains all the way around. Why? Why were we told the walls of the castle were covered in hangings? Castles are notoriously cold. They're drafty. Right? So you have hangings on the wall to stop breezes. I once lived when I was an undergraduate down in, outside Chattanooga. I lived in a, a cabin. The cabin was built back in the 40s for summer occupation. People now rented them for all year round. And I started renting it in late December 84, something like that, just before the big freeze of January 1985. Yeah. I don't know you guys were like colder than hell in the Germanic sense. How cold? A lookout mountain, it didn't get above zero for three days. My toilet froze solid. I had a bottle, I had a cup of water, and the floor on the end of the cabin in the room that I had at the end of the bed because I found a dog that year, a puppy, and rescued it. And at the foot of my bed, it was frozen salt. Okay? But this was a log cabin, and you could see daylight between some of the logs. And if it was windy outside, because I had stapled blankets up, the blankets would sway in the room. But castles were often very similar. So, he pulls up the curtains, and he sees the door open. Takes a glimpse to see what it could be, and it was the lady, looking her loveliest, who shook the door after her carefully. So she comes in, and she does this. If he doesn't, she doesn't want him to realize she's there. The knight felt confused. He lay down again and pretended to be asleep. She comes in. She pulls the curtain aside, steps inside, and closes the curtain. Okay. This is not normal behavior. And here we're told, he shammed being asleep, 1196, wondering what the matter could be leading to. 
Uruk Purim. Now maybe this is just telling us that so that one is really naive. It seemed an astonishing thing, but he told himself, it would be more fitting to discover straightway by talking just what she wants. I don't think she wants to talk. So he opens his eyes, pretends surprise, and she says, good morning, Sir Galleon. You are an unwary sleeper that one can steal in here. Now you are caught in a moment. So we back up. He wakens, 1200, opens his eyes, pretended surprise. So he wakens, turns towards her, opens his eyes, and crosses himself. As if protecting himself by prayer in this sign. Notice he doesn't cross her. He doesn't pull out a crucifix, like be gone, you know, vampire or whatever. And she says, now you're caught in a moment. Lest we grant a truce, I shall imprison you in your bed. Be certain of that. Now, there's all kinds of Freudian language there. Right? And he says, good morning. You shall do with me as you wish. And that pleases me much. What's he just said? I'm yours. And that will please me much. For I surrender at once and beg for your mercy. And that is best in my judgment, for I simply must. Why? Why does he say all that? Because of this. It's all part of the courtly love tradition. See, if he were to say, you slut, you whore, get out of here. He violates one of the central tenets. And one of the central tenets is you can never refuse a woman in such a way that she feels refused. Wrap your head around that one for a bit. You can never reject a woman in such a way that she feels rejected. Well, who came up with that screwy rule? Okay. A monk by the name of Andreas Capulanus translated in the 12th century Translated Ovid's Ars Amatoria, okay, which is the art of love. But he translated it not realizing that Ovid was writing satire. See, Ovid wrote the book Art of Love in the first century, I think it is. Late. 1st century B.C., early 1st century A.D. Drawing a blank for some reason. And he wrote it as a satire for how slimy, grimy, old Roman men can find fresh young women and get them in their beds. Okay? But Ovid's writing it as a satire because he's poking fun at Roman society. What he's doing is he's saying, Look how decadent our society. This is why we're falling apart. All right? He doesn't mean any of what he says seriously. Andreas Kapilovitz comes across, comes across it a thousand years later, and he thinks Ovid is writing the greatest how to have sex manual. How to get young, beautiful women to sleep with you. And he thinks it's serious. So he translates it, Art of Love, Eleanor of Aquitaine, if you watched the previous lecture, talked about or the first lecture, Eleanor uh, Aquitaine reads it, understands it, and she sets up essentially a religion of love in the court of Henry II. Where there are literal priests of love. Okay. Eleanor, by the way, is one of these long serving queens, had a ton of kids, a lot of them became kings. Some of them became kings of other countries and such. She was the mother of John. You know, if you're familiar with the Disney Robin Hood cartoon version, John the First, who became John the Worst. That John, okay, the, the same John, Prince John, in the whole Robin Hood legend. That John, okay, she was his mother, by the way. So when he says all this, he's thinking, I've got to please her with words, because that's part of his courtly love tradition. You, you 
always address the woman as one your superior, and you always address her in a way that favors her. Right? So, and when he says you shall do with me as you wish, what did he say to the two women when he first met them? I am your servant. So he's saying, I will serve you. For I surrender at once and beg for your mercy, and that is best in my judgment, for I simply must. Why does he beg for her mercy? You shall do with me as you wish, but I'm going to beg for your mercy. Beg for mercy kind of implies, but don't ask me to do without naming anything. And she says, thus he rejoked in return, for a burst of laughter, but if, lovely lady, um, excuse me, got that all mixed up. It's the lady who addresses Sir Gowan in response to his comment. Um, she said, you're caught in a moment unless we agree on a tree section. I'm prison you in your bed, be certain of that. Laughing merrily, the lady uttered this jest, because that's implying I'm going to have sex with you right now. And he says, I will do blah, 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 but be merciful. She replies. Uh, excuse me. He goes on. But if, lovely lady, you would grant me leave and release your captain, ask him to rise, I'd get out of his bed and put on proper dress. So, give me a few moments. Let me get out and get dressed. And then we can talk. No, 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 no. No, indeed. Not good, sir. You shall not leave your bed. I intend something better. I shall tuck you in here on both sides of the bed and then chat with my knight whom I have captured. So, the implication is, she either at this point, let's say the bed is here, she, she's either standing here, talking to him, looking down, or she's now sitting on the side of the bed. When she says, I'm going to tuck you in, how do you tuck someone in? You reach around this side, and you reach around this side. So now she's got him pinned. For I know well in truth that you are Sir Gawain, whom everyone reveres wherever you go. Your good name and courtesy, honor of the plays, blah, blah, blah. And then what does she say? 1230. And now, indeed, you are here, and we too are quite alone. My husband, his men, gone far away. Other servants are in bed, and my women too. The door is shut and locked, and the powerful hasp, and since I have under my roof the man everyone loves, I shall spend my time well while it lasts with talk. And she just kind of, she builds and builds and builds, and then we're going to talk. You are you are welcome to me indeed. Take whatever you want. Circumstances force me to be your true servant. So he has said, I'm your servant. She now says, I'm your servant. He says, do with me as you please. She says, you are welcome to me indeed. Take whatever you want. Well, what did the knight of the castle say? on the first night Sir Gowan was there. Anybody remember? Anything you want that's here, go ahead. Have at it. Sir Gowan. Truly, I am greatly honored. She. No, I'm not him, though I am not in fact such a man as you speak of. To deserve such respect as you have just described, I am completely unworthy. I know very well. I should be happy indeed if you thought it proper that I might devote myself by words and by deeds to giving you pleasure. It would be a great joy. He says, I'm not the one you think I am. She replies, notice what you're doing. It's just verbal back and, back and forth. Right? 
in all truth, if the excellence and gallantry everyone admires, I were to slight or disparage, that is, if I were to praise you higher, as high as I can, then I would be dispraising you. She's saying courtesy, okay, notice what's at the heart of both of those, court, manners of the court, behavior of the court, courtesy, she is suggesting, demands I speak this way about you. Uh, if I were to slide or disparage, or disparage, that would hardly be courteous. But a great many ladies would much rather know, would much rather now hold you, sir, in their power as I have you here. To spend time amusing you with your charming talk, delighting themselves and forgetting their cares in much of the treasure or wealth they possess. Right? Many women, she says, would rather spend some time just sitting in here with you talking than having all the treasure and wealth that they have. But I praise that same Lord who holds up the heavens. Thanks be to God that I have completely in my grasp the man everyone longs for through God's grace. God has brought you here to me. Radiant with loveliness, great favor she conferred. That kind of means she pulls out all of the stops in her charms. The knight with virtuous speech answered every word. What? Why is it important with virtuous speech he answered every word? Nothing that he says is off color. Nothing that he says is... Um, What's the word that can mean two different things? Nothing is a double entendre of any sorts. Okay. Everything is above board and clear. And he answers every word. That word, answer, comes comes from, if I remember correctly, on sword or a sword, which means against sword or swear. It's verbal sword fighting. She parries, he deflects with his virtuous speech. Lady, he says, may Mary repay you. So notice what she says. Thank you, God, for bringing Sir Gowan here. So he says, I see you, God. I see your God, and I raise you a Mary. It's like a poker match. Right? God's up there in his heaven. Unknowable, immaterial. Mary we can deal with. Mary was a real flesh and blood person. So, may Mary repay you, for I have truly made proof of your great generosity and many other folk when credit for their deeds. But the respect shown to me is not at all my deserving. The honor is due to yourself who know nothing but good. The honor you're showing me, I don't deserve. But you do. And she says, I see your Mary and I call your Mary. By Mary, in other words, since you swore by Mary, okay, I'll swear by Mary too. To me it seemed very different. For if I were the worthiest of all women alive and held all the riches of earth in my hand, and could bargain and pick a lord for myself for all the virtues I've seen in you, Sir Knight, here, good looks and courtesy and charm. Is good looks a virtue? No, good looks is DNA. That's genetic. But she thinks it is. But the other things that she mentions, courtesy, charming manner, yeah, those are virtues. All that I've previously heard and know how to be true, no man on earth would be picked before you. Who does that no man on earth include? Yeah, her husband is out there hunting. He said, no, oh, you've chosen my path. 
you're a man, your husband, he's a real man, you know. But I'm proud of the esteem that you hold me in, and all gravity, your servant, my sovereign, I consider you. You are my Lord, you are my queen, and declare myself your knight, and may Christ reward you. I see you're married, and I raise you with Jesus. <laughs> I mean, they just keep piling into the pot, the proverbial poker pot of this game that they're playing. This is all tied into here. Okay? Notice the temptation is now wound into this exchange of ways. So what are we told happened? So they chatted of this and that till late morning, and always the lady behaved as if loving him much. What does the as if tell us? Pretending. Pretending doesn't necessarily really love him. Okay. The knight reacted cautiously in the most courteous of ways. He doesn't say anything that offends her. Though she was the loveliest woman he could remember, he felt small interest in love because of the ordeal he was faced very soon. What's he thinking? Oh, I can't get involved in this relationship because I'm going to die. <laughs> what does he think is going to happen on the second part of this? The knight's going to do what he did to him. Go back for a moment to the beheading. What did the knight say? I'm just asking, I want to play a game with you guys. It's Christmas Day, should be fun. What are we told at the very beginning? Arthur wouldn't allow anybody to eat until there was a wonderful tale or a marvel. It comes a big, giant, green guy on a green horse. Okay? And he says, I want to play a game. He doesn't say, I want to kill somebody. Here's the game. What do you take to strike at me? Do whatever you want. You can use my axe. They're like, cool, okay. <laughs> and Sir Gowan does. And notice what Arthur says when the Green Knight taunts them. Come on, you guys are supposed to be the cream of the crop. You're supposed to be the best warriors world. And none of you will accept this challenge? And Arthur, you don't do it, you know. Sir Gawain stands up, Arthur gives him the right, and Arthur says, hit him so hard that he'll blow up. Hit him so hard that what? He dies. That's not a game mentality. Okay? So, he's thinking, when I meet up with this guy, he's got an axe to grind, literally. He's going to want to chop my head off. I can't pick it back up right away. So, he felt small interest in love to stand a crushing blow and help him suffer it, but believing that she spoke the night again once, she bade him goodbye, glanced at him, laughed, and then she rebukes him. May he who prospers each speech repay you this pleasure, but that you should be so Gawain, I very much doubt. He's like, oh, shit. What? Oh, crap. Why? What did I do? The wife of the night fearing he had committed some breach of good manners. He offended her. You can't do that in the courtly love tradition. She says, for this, so good a knight as Gawain is rightly reputed, and whom courtesy is so completely embodied, could not easily have spent so much time with a lady without begging a kiss to comply with politeness. This is standard operating procedure. When a man and a woman in this courtly kind of society separate, you know, you take a kiss by some hint or suggestion at the, he says, let it be as you wish. I will kiss at your bidding as befits a knight. He could have stopped there, right? And do more rather than displease you, so urge it no further. Yeah, I'll give you a kiss and I'll do a lot more than that. I don't want to displease you, so don't ask to do more than that. And with that, she approaches them, takes them in her arms, stoops graciously over and kisses the knight. They commend each other in Christ's keeping. She goes out of the room. He gets up, takes a shower, goes to church, receives the Eucharist, the whole nine yards. And meanwhile, back in the forest, the knight is out hunting. Okay? And we're going to pick up, because we're going to skip all the stuff about gutting the deer. We're going to pick up on 
on page 262 with the knight giving Sir Gallon the deer and Sir Gallon giving the knight a kiss. I don't know that we'll finish on Friday.